Welcome back to Climate TV with me, Eduardo Gonçalves. Today, I'm speaking with Rachel Kite, who's the Vice President of the World Bank Group and also the Special Envoy for Climate Change. Uh, Rachel, you've just been appointed CEO of Sustainable Energy for All, but let me first ask you, um, what do you think that we need to see coming out of the climate negotiations at the end of this year? And also, what's your view on the INDCs? Well, I, I think what we what we need from the negotiators is a negotiated text, which will be just one part of a Paris Agreement, but a, a negotiated text that uh, can be translated to the rest of the world as a very clear, this is the direction of travel, um, this is where we're heading, and we're heading, you know, at a pace and with and some with some determination. So that negotiated text has to speak loudly to economic actors all around the world that this is about low carbon growth and it's about resilient development and you know um, you may peaceably go off and make long-term investments and know that that's the direction we're moving in um, now of course negotiated text is uh, full of uh, you know you can pass it and it's full of many meanings but the political declaration that presumably will wrap around that, the INDCs, the finance agreement, and then the action agenda from all of these amazing partnerships will also be part of that messaging out of Paris. The INDCs, I think, read by the business community, should be understood as emergent investment plans. Um, uh, and these are really the roadmaps for countries in terms of what that low carbon growth looks like for them and what resilient development means for them and how much it's going to cost. Do you think we're starting to see a decoupling of economic growth and carbon emissions? In other words, is there now a very strong uh, pro-business case for uh, climate action? I think it's very clear um, from the economic evidence that we've marshaled, that we've seen from the OECD, um, uh, from other you know, renowned uh, international economic bodies, that the cost of inaction is going to be higher than the cost of action. Um, and so the question really is, what are the macroeconomic and fiscal policies that need to be put in place that will support growth, but low carbon growth, that will allow you to invest in, uh, in resilience because to not do so is going to be massive costs of the dislocation that comes from extreme weather events, et cetera. Um, and you know, what is, the, what is the policy that you put in place that allows for public and private investment to come into that different growth path? Now, is there going to be dislocation? Yes, for some heavily fossil fuel dependent, highly carbon intensive regions and countries and countries that uh, need to really pursue efficiency at revolutionary speed. That's going to be a different management challenge than those who are really in the business of building an energy system for the, for the, from the ground up for the first time. So every country's challenge is different, but every country has a challenge and it's universal. And the INDCs um, are the conversation piece that allows the investors to be part of that conversation. Uh, in your view, are carbon markets and emissions trading schemes an effective way forward? And what's the World Bank view on carbon pricing? So we believe that um, carbon pricing is a necessary but insufficient uh, policy tool if we are going to move at a, a decent pace towards that low carbon growth. It's very difficult to imagine how the world is going to move onto a low carbon growth path if we're not pricing correctly um, uh, carbon uh, as a pollutant. Um, and therefore, um, robust carbon prices which reflect the level of ambition around that growth path are important. Carbon prices that uh, are steadily rising to reflect uh, the innovation that we expect to see in the economy as we learn how to build growth that is not so carbon dependent. Um, these are things which we think are very important. We think that there are benefits from explicit um, carbon prices, either through taxes or through market-based mechanisms, but we understand that many countries are using implicit measures as well. Um, so we, for many years, have worked at the technical level supporting countries. We're now working at a sort of political level in the formation of a carbon pricing leadership coalition, which we expect to be launched in Paris, where many of those who last year signed up to this call for carbon pricing are now saying, OK, we're going to lead on this and we're going to internally price carbon if you're the private sector or for a country you're committed to actually introducing carbon pricing and really interested in working through the difficult issues country by country, jurisdiction by jurisdiction. So yes, for us, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an important policy tool and uh, you know, we're very interested to hear how others 
uh, think about how to get prices right. What would you say is the most important thing, the one thing that business leaders and investors can do to really ramp up the level of ambition around the climate talks? Well, I think we've seen this remarkable shift from sort of rhetorical purity to really wrestling with the internal consequences of understanding where profit and growth is going to come from in a carbon-constrained world through to um, not waiting for the public environment to be hospitable, but to sort of enjoin with the public debate on, OK, well, this is the kind of investment climate we need in order to make long-term investment, through to leaders within sectors saying, well, we're going to go do this even though not everybody else is coming with us and even though the policy environment might not be exactly ripe yet, through to more and more sort of saying, look, you know, government, if you do this, we could do that and, and we're ready to act, through to actually government, uh, pub, private sector just acting in advance of public policy. So this has been a quite speedy evolution. Now what I think we need to see is, um, you know, some fairly... Uh, bold, transparent moves to just show how um, this works. Um, that, uh, for example, in carbon pricing, that you know you can set an internal carbon price. It is changing the decisions you're making about uh, about your business. That is um, leading you in certain directions. And being, by being transparent about it, those jurisdictions in which companies are going to move understand that you know, there will be jobs created, there will be taxes paid, there will be growth, there will be uh, economic activity, and there will be buoyancy. And that uh, this is an opportunity game, not just a risk game. Finally, Rachel, what's your message to climate negotiators when they gather in Paris later this year? I think for the negotiators, um, this, isn't, this isn't any past negotiation. This is... Uh, a text and a negotiation which needs to speak to the whole world. Uh, this is, um, on the one hand, it is sort of insider baseball. Every word has a meaning, every punctuation mark has a meaning. But in the pursuit of a clear negotiated text, the negotiators have to remember that the duty of the negotiations is to send a signal way, way, way beyond the cognoscenti of climate, the cognoscenti of the environment ministries, that this is a text that must speak and resonate with finance ministries, with CEOs. It has to be translatable into C-suite language, translatable into a public discourse where people need to believe that there is a possibility for their increased prosperity and their children's prosperity in a world where we're not dependent on carbon. And if the, if the, if the negotiators can do that, then they will have served uh, an enormous purpose. Rachel Kite, thank you very much. I was speaking there to Rachel Kite from the World Bank and the new CEO of Sustainable Energy for All. That's all we've got time for today. From all of us at the Climate Group, goodbye. <laughs>